guys, it's fantastic to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming along. And thank you to uh, Silly Bar and Historic Houses for having me. Uh, as Bernadette mentioned, my name is Max Burns McRuby, and uh, it is a real honour to be able to present on the research that I have done for my master's thesis on the origins of international tourism in Sydney. I think it's quite a rare thing, in fact, to be able to present on, uh, on a thesis in general, to be honest. The, uh, the general saying is that uh, only three people read your master's thesis. It's usually your supervisor that helps you put it together, and then the two markers who then tear it apart. Um, mine was a little bit different, because I think I got it to five people. My parents were very kind. But I always thought that this presentation would be a little bit better suited to this type of presentation, because it is a story. And um, I think I'm a little bit more of a storyteller than I am a scholar. And I think the visuals are going to really help us tonight. So I've put together a presentation. And uh, I've really tried to dig into the origins of Sydney's international tourism industry in its earliest beginnings to try and understand how the city felt about what was happening in the world and how Sydney was becoming an international tourism destination by you know, taking their voice from the papers, from primary source material, instead of us just reflecting back, well, you know, that looks pretty in the picture, really getting a gauge on, on how they were coming to terms with Sydney's kind of debut as a global destination. And it really started by me looking into when did it all start for Sydney and where could I find some evidence about where it started. And I found this absolute treasure trove of texts. And these texts, uh, every time, everyone I, I, I show them to or talk to about them uh, are quite surprised by how early they come about because they are basically the very first visitor guidebooks, the very first kind of lonely planet to Sydney, but they're written over 150 years ago. They're written with fantastic, romantic Victorian language, but they're written about the very streets that you still know very well. And they go into immense detail and often into illustrations, basically trying to bring the city to life and writing the very first tourism campaigns of Sydney. Because it was all about turning Sydney into a product and into an experience that travellers could then come and consume. So I'm going to be using them as the basis of my uh, primary source material and then a lot of interesting snippets from reports and from the newspapers. So a few quotes will be thrown at you and uh, for some reason when I read uh, a quote from the 1870s I put on a ridiculous Victorian accent. I'm not sure why, so forgive me for that in advance. Thank you. <laughs> now, the very first guidebook that I came across uh, is called Lee's Handbook to Sydney and its Suburbs. And all of these guidebooks have a, a sort of page at the start where they, they talk about why they wrote them, a preface. And I find Lee's is quite interesting because it's written in 1868. Now, I'm trying to get that into the timeline. It's the, you know, it's, it's the middle Victorian period. We've had the gold rush in Australia. Uh, the 50s have brought in a lot of wealth through the gold rush. The 60s are kind of reaping the rewards for that. Um, communications are starting to improve, but the Suez Canal is still not open. It'll be open in 1869. So this is pre that. Steam shipping has also picked up a lot around the world, and I'll talk about these technologies as we go. But just put that into the timeline of your understanding of Sydney. And in 1868, the preface wrote this. Until within a recent period, scarcely any travellers visit, visited the Australian colonies. Those who favoured us with their presence did not come merely to view the colonies in a topographical or philosophical light. All were more or less bent upon settling down. But now, that communication with the Northern Hemisphere has become easy of accomplishment, our shores are frequently visited by what we may truly term travellers people of substantial means who, in search of health or pleasure, take a trip to Australia as our forefathers used to take a run over the continent. Now that's a long time ago for Sydney to be recognising 
that travelers who were traveling here purely for the sake of healthful pleasure, not to immigrate, not to trade, but to come and see what we look like, okay, over 150 years ago coming to town, just as their forefathers used to take a run over the continent. Do you know what that run was called? It's called the Grand Tour, okay? So the other title I was going to give my work was From Grand Tours to Globetrotters. And I'm going to be talking about that term today, Globetrotter, because that's going to come around at this time as well. But by, guys, this, this particular presentation is not just about Sydney, it's about how Sydney fits into the world of global travel, of globetrotting. It wasn't something that Sydney invented, but it did incorporate what was going on in the rest of the world. So it is a larger story. And that story probably involves some names that you may have heard of before, including Thomas Cook. And Thomas Cook, you may know as a brand, but he was a, he was a dude. And he was a very important person in the history of commercial tourism, mass tourism, and connecting tourism with all sorts of interesting things. Connecting it with railways, with steamships, taking it from England across to the continent, sort of following in the footsteps of the grand tourists of the 18th and 17th century, but opening it up to a Victorian crowd that often weren't as rich or aristocratic as the original grand tourists. They could go on Cook's tours, they were often group tours, and they didn't need to speak any languages because they had guides and interpreters, and he came up with all sorts of methods of making travel easier that I'm going to talk about. So he's very much involved, and he's the business side of tourism finding its place in the world. But he influenced literature. In fact, he, interests, he influenced one of my favourite books of all time. I hope most people here have read or heard of it, and if you haven't, go back and get it. It's a fantastic piece, especially on a long car journey. There's some great audio versions of this. It's called Around the World in 80 Days. And it's written by Jules Verne. I'm going to talk about how Jules Verne comes into the picture. And he's very connected and influenced by Thomas Cook. So this is an era where traveling around the world is not just in the hands of some corporate business uh, folks. It's also in the hands of adventure writers. And this is going to inspire the world to want to travel around the world. Technologies, like I said, are going to be super important. And we'll know these technologies, but perhaps like me, your timeline can be a bit uh, jagged as to when they come about. So rail, we're going to look at the steam engine and uh, also steamers across the Pacific, for instance, and then big changes in the routes for ships around the world, such as the Suez Canal in 1869, that really allow the journey to get from the northern to the southern hemisphere to be cut in half. So they're going to be big factors. But the other massive factor, which also Garden Palace gin and tonic. <laughs> the also huge factor that is going to really influence tourism at the time that I discovered were international exhibitions. International exhibitions were enormous events. They were arts and industrial fairs. But what I would like to argue is that they were actually the very first major international tourist attractions. They were built to show off the goods, the wares, the machinery, the arts, the culture of the world to the world. But they were in cities that you had to get to to visit, starting off with cities like London, Paris, moving on to places like Vienna and Philadelphia. And then this strange city comes along and goes, we'll have one, we'll join that squad. And it's a little bit like those shirts you see, you know, they're sort of like made in New York, London, Paris, and Wollongong, <laughs> you know? Sydney's gonna put his hand up and say, well, how about we host an international exhibition? And sure enough, Sydney was an up and coming destination, but it was also under 100 years old as a city, and it was only 30 to 40 years beforehand that the very first, the very last convict ship had actually arrived in Sydney. Yeah, that's a big transformation between receiving prisoners and being seen by the world as a, a dumping ground for prisoners to becoming basically a city that's welcoming the world and hosting this enormous international affair and saying, come and look at us because we are amazing and you want to come and travel here, see our city and experience this show and we really want to put ourselves on the map. So I think more than anything else, 
This story tonight is a coming of age story about a little town you know, sh shaping off its shackles, its former convict heritage, and basically opening itself up into the world, becoming a global city. And more than anything else, I think, having researched uh, this topic for quite some time, it's, it's a story much more about identity than it is about tourism. But tourism is all about shaping how the rest of the world sees your city, you know? And we have tourism campaigns today that do just that. Um, for instance, I was getting involved in tourism uh, around 2008. I started to, to run history tours. And at the time, they had a tourism campaign that was called Designed to Inspire, and that was referring to Sydney. Sydney, Designed to Inspire. And um, we're very good at sort of short one-liners in tourism campaigns today, but I think all of them have actually come from the original tourism literature of the 1870s and 80s. They're, they're a little bit longer, the, the wording's a little bit much for a, a single flashy one-liner in an Instagram story. But we, we take these ideas about Sydney's, you know, uh, design and how it's sort of in a perfect place uh, from, I think, these original stories. So in, in that very handbook I talked to you about before, it says, Sydney is perfectly placed. She sits proudly on the magnificent waters of Port Jackson, under the gorgeous sky of Australia, opening her bays to the shipping of all nations and her hospitality to the thousands who daily land on her shore. She may well claim to be called the Queen of the Pacific. Now, to me, I actually quite like that marketing a little bit more than design to inspire. And I invited Tourism Australia and Destination New South Wales to take advantage of some of the marketing material that our forefathers have put together. Both parties declined to come to the table to experience that tonight. So if you see some really tacky zillion dollar marketing campaign to try and kickstart Australian tourism, and they've missed the mark because you know the origin story, about how it all came about from tonight, then you know who to blame, okay? Other marketing campaigns, we, we call upon big names, like Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth, everyone knows Chris Hemsworth? I moved up to Byron last year, everyone talks about Chris Hemsworth as if he invented Byron Bay, it's, it's incredible. Um, in any case, Hemsworth has an ad on the uh, tourism channel, if there is one, and um, you may have seen it, it's a very well put together ad, and its motto is Australia. I can't do the deep voice. I, mean, I never look like a lot like it, honestly, but I can't do the deep voice. Australia isn't just a place you see, it's a place you feel. Have you seen this ad? All right, no, it's not much. But he's just stolen that from Anthony Trollope. 142 years ago, Anthony Trollope came to Sydney and he was a, a British novelist, but he was sort of the first major writer to write about Sydney Harbour and, and so on. And, and he talked about the way you feel when you leave Sydney Harbour. So 142 years before Hemsworth comes along, he says, Sydney is one of those places which, when a man leaves it, knowing that he will never return, he cannot leave without a pang and a tear. Such is its loveliness. Yeah, that's why it makes you feel so much. So, that lovely Sydney stays in your bones. And the one you probably do know is from 1984, and that was Paul Hogan. You know this one, surely. Okay? It looks so dated now. It's fantastically vintage. But um, at the end of the ad, he's sitting around at a barbecue. He's got the Opera House bridge in the background. He's having a beer, and he says, Come and say good day. The beer's cold, and I'll even throw another shrimp on the barbie for you. Now, he's stolen that from a travelling correspondent in Sydney from 1875, very obviously, who said that the correct thing to do after dinner in Sydney appears to be playing billiards, eating oysters and crabs, or going from public house to public house, drinking glasses of British beer and flirting with the barmaids. So they're tapping into these campaigns, and your hard-earned tax dollars are paying for just regurgitated material. Sure, I've discovered where they were coming from. So some things haven't changed very much in Sydney, and I think um, it's interesting to note that the idea of, of selling the story of Sydney and, and creating it into a, a product and experience hasn't gone too far. But what has changed, guys, which I think is really important, is the fact that up until COVID, so March 2019, um, in, the, in the year before that, 4.1 million international tourists came to Sydney. 4.1 million 
Okay, our population is only about 25 million all of Australia. Um, they spent about 10 billion in Sydney. So it is an enormous part of our economy, and I believe that the presentation I'm going to be talking about tonight were really the uh, the forefathers of its earliest stages. And when I look at the text and the literature written about Sydney tourism, basically everyone says, well, it didn't really get involved in the international game until Thomas Cook started his first office, his first tour agency in Sydney on Bridge Street in 1889. So they say that's the start, and that's when Sydney was connected to the rest of the Thomas Cook Empire. For me, that's the end of my presentation tonight. I'm going to be journeying towards that. I'm going to look at the two decades that precede Thomas Cook and look at the local operators. And being a local operator of a tours company in Sydney myself, I, I empathise with these local operators, making it up as they go along, trying to tap into a travel market, and, you know, adapting to all of the strange events that are going on there, you know what's going on next in Sydney. And founding this tourism industry off the back of the global travel phenomena that was happening at the time. So that is really the basis and um, quite a lengthy introduction just to tell you what my topic's about. In any case, as I said, the guidebooks themselves are going to be telling half the story and um, I'm going to be looking at some of the guidebook material but also, no, this is a big moment for whether this works or not. Yeah, here is the Illustrated Guide to Sydney and its Suburbs, first published in 1879. It has over 50 illustrations in it, incredible detail, and delicate woodcut engravings, uh, price one shilling. It's, it's an encyclopedia of Sydney. I don't think anyone's ever written so much about every street. It walks you through, Pitt, George, you name it, and also because we are in uh, a precinct that a lot of City of Sydney Council money's gone into. You know what it's called? YCK. What does that stand for? York, Clarence, York, Clarence and Kent. So they were the original writers about the YCK precincts, and we can go back to their stories. And immediately I, I flicked to York, Clarence and Clint, Kent, and I learned something I didn't know straight away. I learned, the guidebook pointed out, that the streets in this area are named after the male children of King George III. So, York Street is named after his second son, Frederick, Duke of York. Clarence Street is named after his third son, William, Duke of Clarence, who then went on to be King William IV. And uh, Kent Street is named after his son Edward, Duke of Kent. So, you learn all of these amazing things from these guidebooks. His poor old first son was also named George, and we already had a George Street. But he, before he became king himself, was Prince Regent. And once upon a time, we had an enormous street in the rocks called Prince's Street, and we still have a Regent Street, thanks to the many monarchs involved in Sydney. Now, on Kent Street, this guidebook talks about the fact that there was the model lodging house, and this was a great institution, they said. So you get a clean and comfortable bed for nine pence, pretty cheap, with use of a fire, reading room and bath, but no meals are supplied on the premises. To put that in perspective, right next door on York Street was the most fashionable and you would say the premier international hotel of Sydney in the 1870s, and it was called Petty's. And Petty's was described in the guidebook as the resort of the most distinguished visitors to Sydney, including English and French noblemen when visiting New South Wales. And to stay at Petty's would cost over two pounds a night. Now, at the time, there were 500 pence in, uh, sorry, there were 240 pence in a pound. So that's nearly 500 pennies in two pounds. Divide that by nine pence. And the answer is, it would cost over 50 times more to stay at Petty's on York Street than it would a lodging house on Kent Street. And I think that alone gives you a real sense of the diversity that was already on offer to visitors to Sydney at that time. From the backpackers right up to the high class establishments, even in the streets around us, there were great options for you to be able to stay on a budget uh, or right up to a very fancy place. York Street though, had this very fancy hotel, Penny's. I'll talk about more about that. But it also says that um, 
at the Market Street corner is situated one of the queerest as well as the most notorious taverns of olden days. I love the fact they refer to olden days, and this is 1879. It says, which used to be kept open for receiving the dregs of society. It was no uncommon thing for a couple of hundred of the aged, blind, lame, and other unfortunates of both sexes to be congregated in and around the building at one time to receive their morning dram. Now, do you know what a morning dram is? It's a glass of whiskey or rum in the morning. So they would be hanging out for that, and it says, happily for the city and its people, no place of that sort of entertainment and description now exists. But we're bringing that back tonight. And I hope that in another 150 years, they'll be talking about the olden days on Kent Street, when we came out on a Tuesday night, having our dram, to listen to history about the olden days. Sydney is an evolving city, but something's going to change. The idea of uh, globetrotting is something I want to talk about first. And um, just to catch up with myself, this is, this is the city uh, in the year that those guidebooks were written, and that is the amazing Garden Palace the International Exhibition of 1879, as I said, as Sydney joined the table. Talk a bit more about that, of course, when I get to that chapter, but, you know, it was, it was the Olympics of the 19th century in Sydney, and it's going to be a big factor of putting us on the map and kick-starting the tourism industry here. Um, aside from that, Question? What happened to that building? Are you trying to skip to chapter four when I haven't even read chapter one? <laughs> Who's this charming gentleman? Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook. You know, for, for a man who came from very humble origins, and I'll talk about his life story, and became an absolute trillionaire. He doesn't look too happy in this very rare photo of him, um, but I'll get to him as well. Other characters I wanted to bring alive. You know who that very attractive gentleman is? Anybody know? <laughs> I thought he looked a bit like Thomas Cook. It's not Thomas Cook. That is who this, this street is named after there. That's the Duke of Kent. All right. So the Duke of Kent, who's the uh, third son of, or fourth son of uh, King George III. Now, in 18... 70, uh, sorry, in 1772, Captain Cook decided, well, was really sent by the Navy to go on his second major mission, okay, on the ship Resolution. And he's going to go around the world. It's going to take him three years. He's already been down to New South Wales. But this trip is really about trying to find this mysterious Terra Australis incognita and proving once and for all that, you know, Australia was it or there wasn't one at all and he basically solves that so he was a great navigator and he, he does the full whopper the big loop um, but that was unknown territory and it was really about you know going into the, the blank holes of the Pacific and trying to prove that uh, there wasn't this huge land there so that's 1872 in 1772 in 1872 so that's exactly a hundred years later we have Thomas Cook going off on a world trip around the world. Who know what that does? His trip will take seven months, and it will be the very first inaugural mission in which he takes ten tourists on a trip, which takes advantage of the recent connections around the world, which allowed him to make this circuit pretty easily. Now, those connections are really important to the history of tourism because they allow people to move a lot more. And the first one was that he traveled from England across the Atlantic, he reaches New York, and he then catches the Transcontinental Railway. Transcontinental Railway has just been connected in 1870, and it allows him to travel all the way across the entire continent of North America on the same train to get to San Francisco. So that's a huge connection. So he goes across there, and um, you saw a lot along the way. When he gets to San Francisco, he's then going to take advantage of a whole new uh, breed of mail steamer. So these are big ships, they're carrying mail and goods, but they also carry passengers, and they're zipping across the Pacific, particularly to places like Japan, which have really opened up in the last few years. So he's going to go to Japan, and he is also 
going to visit then China, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Sri Lanka, India, and then he's going to go up the next big, big thing that really changes travel, Can you? Uh, which is going to be the Suez Canal. Now, the Suez Canal was opened in 1869. Uh, what two seas does it connect? It connects the Red Sea with the Mediterranean. And that's going to be a whopper because it means you don't have to go around Africa anymore. So he's going to shoot up into the Mediterranean and he will visit Constantinople and then he will go into Europe and eventually he will end up where he started. So this was a huge feat to be able to go around the world and lead a tour party to do that. And um, when he gets back to England and says that his exploration was not about exploring the unknown world as his namesake Captain Cook had done. He says his was a pioneering expedition more for the purpose of sounding the way and seeing what was necessary, necessary to be done to satisfy the demands of inquiries about the practicability and expense of tours around the world. Now this is the early 1870s, so tours around the world and you know coming up with an itinerary that fit everything in, this was, this was pretty big. And he reported on this as he went. So he was always uh, sending letters to the Times in London. They were publishing them. And that was great advertising for him. And his, his company uh, would have advertisements underneath, which basically said, you know, be ready because Thomas will be back soon. And then you too can book a trip around the world. And at that particular time, sitting in a Parisian cafe, reading the French news in 1872, we have a man who read this article and thought, well, how long is it really going to take him? Seven months, all right. And he's stopping there, he's stopping there. What if he didn't stop? What if he kept just, you know, making connections, connections, connections? And, and in the papers, it also had uh, the schedules for steamships and rail ships. And uh, this guy who likes to put together stories in his head, but also figure out some maths. He put it all together around the, the world, and he had it, you know, just done it in one go. And how many days did he get to? He thought it would be the, 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 amount, the amount he could do. 80 days. 80 days. Around the world in 80 days. And this here is Phileas Fogg, a man so precise, who could meet every single train and steamship, and when he doesn't, he grabs an elephant to go across India. He, he is your ultimate Victorian gentleman. He doesn't care about the, the world. He just wants to get from A back to A by uh, following the very precise uh, itineraries that the British Empire really set up to win a wager, okay? Phileas Fogg will be the brainchild of the, uh, the novelist Jules Verne, and Jules Verne, admits that he got his inspiration for that fantastic book in a cafe one day from uh, Thomas Cook's advertisement. So a lot of these things are coming about very quickly at the same time. Now, a great quote in Verne's novel is, he says, uh, this is a conversation between Fogg and a few other people at the, um, the club, in uh, this is called the Reform Club in London. He says, I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller since a man can now go around it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago. So the world has grown smaller because we can go around it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago. I think there's a lot in that statement when you think about it. And it inspires a word, a word that I've already brought up, and that word was globe-trotting. The idea that the globe has shrunk and that you can not just, you know, explore around it or even travel around it. You can simply trot around it. The world's nothing on us anymore. We've got it all worked out. This was a big Victorian mentality. So globe trotting will emerge in the early 1870s as a word. By the 18, uh, mid 1870s, globe trotting became an absolutely very, very common uh, phenomenon. So much so that um, an Australian tourist went, well, I'll go globe trotting, you know, I'll join the, the British that are going around the world. So he wrote um, a, a book, it's called Brief Notes of an Australian Globetrotter on his journey around the world. But he's quite disappointed because he thought he was going to be this, you know, you know, single traveller who was out on the high roads and, you know, one of a kind. People say, what are you doing? He's like, going around the world. Everyone would be applauding him as he went along, you know, like the good old days. But no, he says, go where you will on the great high roads of the earth. The multitude of travellers and globetrotters of every nationality that swarm the way affords convincing evidence that the facilities of travel at the present time 
are not such as characterise the period when fame followed the completion of a tour. So he was looking for that fame that Captain Cook got, but a hundred years have gone past and Globetrotter's really caught up, so he loses that. And um, we also have other books, The Rambles of a Globetrotter in Australasia, written in uh, 1875. And Sydney will be part of this, but it doesn't actually get to be part of Cook's original journey. And uh, that meant that it had to feed off just the movement rather than Cook's organised travels. That makes sense? It's part of the world itinerary for globetrotting, but it doesn't get Cook's original blessing by visiting Sydney on his original journey in 1872. And Cook really set the story, so so many people are just following the exact itinerary that he did, going to Japan and everything else. So Sydney's trying to get involved on its own terms. And I like that, it's sort of, you know, coming up with its own literature. So instead of Thomas Cook's continental travel guides that everyone else is buying, travel guidebooks are starting to be published in Sydney, about Sydney, to try and show people the continent here when they arrive. And um, we have another guy who enters the travel guide story. And um, I mentioned earlier that uh, the first one was written in 1868. The next one is really written in 1872. And in 1872, we have a guy who publishes a series that will go on for the next 15 years. He publishes one every couple of years. I have gone to the State Library and uh, I have put on the white gloves and dug them out and they were beautiful, beautiful books. They are leather bound. They are incredibly intricate. And not only that, in the back section, it has a canvas fold out map of the city of Sydney in the 1870s. So it's a photo uh, from the library. Very detailed and um, much better quality than the, the lonely planets of today, in fact. His name was um, Maddox. And Maddox ran a, a library and a bookstore on George Street. And um, this is quite interesting, I think. So in 1872, he has basically finished his first volume and in the preface he says, visitors from Europe as well as America are numerous. That's 1872. Then he finishes his next uh, volume in 1874. He says, we sold out 1872 overnight. Got to, got to publish a new one now. And this one was quite big because it included a whole other section uh, called the Tourist's Handbook. And in 1874, he says this. This is probably, I think, what really got me started on this idea of tourism happening a lot earlier than we think in Sydney. He says, visitors to the colony are now becoming exceedingly numerous, every day bringing a fresh, fresh accession of tourists. A voyage from Europe to Sydney can now be made with such rapidity and safety by the mail boats that a trip from England to Sydney by way of the Suez Canal and home by way of the island San Francisco across America is fast becoming a matter of course to everyone who desires to see what the world contains or to benefit his health and who has the leisure to indulge his inclinations. It's a very wordy way of saying the tourists are arriving. Get ready, businesses, because it's not just your odd explore anymore. It's a matter of course to everyone who desires to see what the world contains. And Maddock is going to be right there saying, hey, I can turn Sydney into a product. The product is a tourist handbook. But well, what's fantastic about a tourist handbook? It's a lot of advertising material in there. So he starts to hunt around to get people buying pages of advertising for, what do you reckon? Hotels, retail, travel bookstores, haircuts, liquor, travel insurance, transport excursions, you name it. Every second page in Maddox 1878 version is an advertisement, which means he's starting to put the chips together. The tourism is an industry that can tap into travel, whether it's through literature or whether it's through uh, basically getting people into an accommodation and selling the tour on the site there. If every single tour or trip that you've ever booked, I'm sure there's been a third party that inspired you to do it, whether that was a piece of literature or a recommendation. And he is there on the ground saying, Sydney doesn't have Thomas Cook, so I'm gonna make a penny off this. And we have the word tourist reaching Sydney. So by uh, the 1870s, we're using that word quite commonly. Would you have thought that, that the word tourist was being thrown around in Sydney in the 1870s? 
that was something that really uh, struck me. And in 1858, one of the first guidebooks to Sydney was written. It was called Stranger's Guide to Sydney. But we didn't actually tap into tourists then or international visitors. It was looking at people from the country who were strangers to the city. Maybe they were doing some shopping, so they needed a bit of a map to get around. Then in the 1868 version I told you at the start, we had travellers. So travellers, it said, from the Northern Hemisphere were coming to town. In the 1872 version, the first Matic edition, he says visitors from the Northern Hemisphere were coming common. But by 1874, it's tourists. And I think there's also something in that because the language is defining itself as we go along. Now, I've always been interested in etymology to get to the basis of words. And something is quite interesting when you talk about the difference between a couple of these words, especially the difference between a traveler and a tourist because they get interchanged quite a lot. The word travel, pardon my very bad French accent, comes from Old French. And you may have noticed that travel and travail, travailler, okay, the French verb for to work, are very, very similar. And in the old days, traveling from A to B was pretty hard work. You had to go through lots of obstacles. We're talking about, you know, muddy roads, which we're getting robbed along the way. You didn't really travel, okay, unless you had to get somewhere, usually for work. So travel and difficulties and obstacles and work were intertwined. So we have travel coming from the French word to work. Okay? However, tour comes from another French verb, which is tourner. And tourner refers to a turn or a circuit. Take a turn around the garden. So we go from uh, a starting point to take a certain circuit and we return back to our origin. So tour comes from tourner. So in that, we have one that is basically you working to get from A to B, and the other, you going out, knowing that you're going to return. So it's much more of a leisurely thing, is to take a circuit, usually for some kind of reason. You're, you're sightseeing, you're doing it for leisure, it might be a military tour where you're inspecting the troops. But we have the grand tour, really taking advantage of this idea of it being a circuit around Europe to sort of bring you into culture and uh, improve your uh, sophistication in the 18th and 17th century. So young aristocrats would go out on a grand tour to basically visit the great classical cities of Europe. And um, they would uh, stay in hotels and they would have guides and interpreters along the way. They would also have luggage couriers who would help them out. And in every way, the grand tourists did have basically a tourism industry attached. But it wasn't something centralised like Thomas Cook's going to come along and do. It was independent operators and hoteliers from each city that they went to. So we could say that tourism begins on the grand tour, but not as the way we know it. Not as this thing you can book from the start, okay? So the grand tourists will certainly kick it off. And in terms of really defining these terms, I think the, the easiest way that I've tried to put it together, which is going to lead into the idea of tourism in Sydney, is that travelling becomes touring when a third party makes it more convenient, comfortable and consumable for you. Think about that. It needs a third party. What's the third party? Well, convenience might be a travel agent, transport provider, city guides, local guide, money exchange, and luggage courier, you pay a service to make it more convenient. And they get money off that, but your tourer is a little bit easier. Comfortable, well, combination and transport are the main ones where you want your comfort along the way, especially what the grand tour is wanted. And consumable, well, this is the idea of turning the city or whatever the destination into an experience or a product. So we're looking at tours on the ground, we're looking at souvenirs that you can buy to take home, and we're looking at all the places you're going to pay to visit, so cultural institutions or events like international events and all the other travel accessories and luggage along the way. So that's really my definition, and that's where tourism comes into play, because you pay a premium to have that service that convenience, that comfort, and that consumable ability to basically be able to travel for this relatively new phenomenon of traveling for leisure, okay? Now, I've talked about the first Grand Tourists. They are a whole other subject which needs a whole bit of time, but um, that won't be us today. I do have an image of them, but it just aren't really working too well for me today, so I'll get back to that. What I would like to say is that um, the Grand Tourists, oh, there they are, look at them. This is a painting from 1750 and it's called English Gentry in Rome. 
All right. Now, they followed guidebooks as well. They were very famous uh, travel guidebooks. They were more like memoirs rather than the sort of Thomas Cook travel guidebook or the Sydney ones. And they're often pretty saucy because they were sort of, you know, talking about the, um, the bits and pieces they got up to and the, you know, the brothel around the corner and the Coliseum that you know, go and talk to Lydia and so on. They, they were sort of first-hand accounts about the experiences that these young men had. And people would take them around like Bibles and follow and even try and, you know, find the same brothel and the same lady and get up to the same um, notorious behaviour. So the Grand Tour was a bit of a coming of age for these gents and um, they followed guidebooks but not in the way that we know them today. They were much more journals that had been written. Um, now, this all changes in the, in the 19th century because the technologies change. The Grand Tour was all about going through roads and you paid for someone to help your co coach get along. Sometimes you had to cross the Alps and if you're really rich, you basically did that like an emperor of Rome, you know, sitting back in a little cart and people cross the Alps for you. But when we move into the 19th century, we have technologies that allow people to move around Europe without having all of the money in the world to, to help them get across. The big one is rail. This is one of the very first um, locomotive rail trains. This is from the 1830s, you can see them hopping on board there. But rail explodes, it's really called the railway revolution thanks to the steam engine. And um, just a few stats, so in 1835, early days for railway, there's only 350 miles of rail laid across England. No one saw that. Only 350 miles of rail across England in 1835. By 1850, that's 15 years later, there's 6,500 miles laid across England. It explodes and it was called the Iron Horse. And the Iron Horse will be the first major ticket which is going to bring in transport and tourism to a new age. And basically, who's gonna be there tapping into the Iron Horse? Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook was a temperance man. He wanted to preach about not drinking this. He wanted to get big groups together. And he was also an ex-Bible uh, salesman. And he started to become interested in the possibilities of carriages on trains to be able to put a whole bunch of people together and transport them from A to B. And when you've got a whole bunch of people, you can have power in numbers to drive down the price of the railway trip. So he would negotiate with the railway companies to get a concession fare to take a whole bunch of people to a big temperance meetup, and of course you need a return fare and everybody needed something to eat so he would negotiate with the local cafeterias or wherever they're getting the temperance things this is in the midlands by the way and he started to realize that if you were kind of the tour guide and tour operator and you could go to transport or accommodation or food and say I got 500 people that all need a night to stay somewhere or something to eat. I know you generally charge X amount. Let's slash that in half because you're going to get massive numbers. Then people started to go, okay, okay. And he kind of came up this light bulb moment. It's called mass travel. And he started to take excursions to Scotland to show people the scenery. And they were sort of one to two night stays. And he gained a name for himself in the 1840s as someone who could move people, great numbers of working class people, he was a working class man himself, on discount fares to get to things. And England had something people wanted to get to, all right, which is going to come about in 1851. And what was that? It was the first of our enormous exhibitions. This is the train to get to the exhibition. I could rewind just in the middle of this very delicate mouse. You can see the glass. Uh, the Crystal Palace. Give it a bit of time. The Crystal Palace, guys, kicks off world exhibitions. It was in London, and it was the most exciting thing that ever happened in London, I think. It was this enormous arts and industry fair, a huge display of everything new and modern, but also all of these colonial goods from around the world and different uh, exhibitions for almost every country to show off their wares and everybody was invited to see it so it wasn't just for the high class and they wanted the working class to basically get to the exhibition they thought that it would improve their kind of level of sophistication and that meant that they needed 
a train to bring the masses in, but they also needed someone who could kind of take care of the uh, ability to get a return fare and travel people all the way to London and back. Thomas Cook put up his hand and he was basically given a, an interview with the architect of this amazing building, the Crystal Palace and um, the Midlands Railway. And he said, well, look, if I can drive down this fare, then I'll, I'll do it. Um, but he also knew that people wouldn't just want to go to the, to the fair and return back the very next day. Uh, so he would give them a couple of nights of accommodation in London. So he took a big gamble and he rented out about 10 boarding houses, every single room, before the fair was even on in London. So he actually had the ticket to give you a return fare and accommodation in London. So we're talking about travel starting to become a package deal. He does this in 1851. He transported by the end of the Great Exhibition in London 165,000 people, mainly working class, to go and see the uh, exhibition itself. So that was a big win for him. And he made a bit of money out of it, but he also made a great name for himself as someone that could move people from A to B. And the very, uh, well, four years later, Paris said, well, if London's put on this great exhibition, we've got to top them, we're going to have the the uh, Exposition Universal, we're gonna invite even more people, we're gonna put on an even bigger show. And Thomas Cook said, how about I take my idea and we do the very first tour to the continent following the railway to take a group of people to the exhibition and basically take advantage of the fact that we could travel over to, he goes to Belgium and visit a few countries along the way through Germany and end up at the Universal and then do a little day tour to see uh, the a stopping ground of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. So he adds on a little side to it, which he charges a premium for, okay? He also organises um, accommodation in Paris. He, he organises a few trips down the Seine, so he's got activities. In every way, he's kind of coming up with this idea of, of travel that we know today, but this was totally new. And this is in 1855. Then by the 1860s, he's gone gangbusters, and he realises we can take this much further. And he starts to enter into Italy and he basically copies the Grand Tour, but he taps into railways instead of just individuals traveling on the Grand Tour. So we've got Italy, he then goes into the Nile by the uh, uh, late 1860s. He does uh, river cruises along the Nile and then to the Holy Land. This is gonna be where we get to, but uh, he will eventually realize, let's just go all the way. And by the 1870s, he already uh, has been called unquestionably, for there being have, there have been many complaint claimants, the pioneer of a new system of travelling, upon which middle class people who can speak no language but their own have been able to enjoy foreign travel, to visit nearly every civilised country in the world. Cook and Son provide not only the means of locomotion, but take the tourists under their wings and lend them their ears, eyes and hands. Their tickets cover 100, hundreds of thousands of miles of sea and land and their book show at the end of the year, they have shepherded nearly 10 million travellers on their tours. Okay, that's by the 1870s. So he really takes it to the next level. Now what I'm gonna finish on for the first half of my set is that Thomas Cook was going to include Sydney on his very first mission around the world, that one in 1872. That was on the itinerary. And when he put out the itinerary, he didn't get many hits. Maybe Sydney just wasn't exotic enough. As soon as he redirected the route to go to Japan, people started putting their hand up. So Sydney did miss out. And Sydney, I think, felt like, well, the rest of the world are doing these loops. We're going to have to start our own reason for people to come here. And I think these guidebooks are very much part of that. But what else will be part of it? It's called event travel. If we realize that people are going to A to B to get to somewhere, let's host a big event. You build it and they will come. And they are going to do that all on their lonesome. So we will move on to my next half, which starts with Destination Sydney, and talking about how Sydney is tapping into Thomas Cook. But I really think understanding global travel up to that point allows us to really uh, fit Sydney's story into this much bigger, amazing, around the world in 80 days mission that was happening at the time. So I hope um, that's laid the foundations for what's next. Thank you very much for the first half of your attention.
Thomas Cook's itinerary, but that doesn't mean it wasn't involved in the world of global travel and globe trotting. This is Sydney from above in 1888. By that stage, the city itself is uh, a pretty green, a well greased machine, and I'm going to lead up to uh, that period. But I still want to talk about these early days in the 1870s where Sydney's trying to basically tap into a travel market. And the travellers that are coming here are a little bit different, I think, to your Thomas Group travellers because they are booking usually uh, you know, 50 to 60, sometimes even 100 person group tours to Italy where everyone stays in the same place, everyone eats the same thing. They are being shepherded and usually with a local guide uh, that is meeting them at the destination. Whereas in Sydney, you were on your own. You came to Sydney and you booked your own transport. And that meant that you had to negotiate fares and link up steamships. It wasn't that hard, but you didn't have a travel agent to do it for you in the 1870s. Not only that, you didn't have someone who's pre-booked your accommodation and utilised a couple of the convenient services that Thomas Cook has brought into the picture. One of them was called the uh, coupon system. And the coupon system was basically you booking a ticket which included transport, but then when you got to your hotel, instead of having to pay accommodation and pay for food, you cashed in these coupons and that included your board. And it was a great way for Thomas Cook to basically invent his own money. Okay, coupons. And that meant he would sell you coupons and you then had a fixed price to, um, to use them at accommodation around the world. He invented that in 1868. By the 1890s, over 12,000 hotels in the world used, used Thomas Cook's coupons. So it was a huge deal. In 1874, he also invented something called the circular note. The circular note was a similar story, but instead of just being able to use that at a hotel, it was basically the origins of the traveler's check. It was Thomas Cook money that you bought at a fixed rate, and then you could cash in at the Thomas Cook agency in that city, or after a while, banks themselves and hotels for real money in the currency of that particular country, which saved a lot in conversion rates. All of those things were being invented and used by Thomas Cook, but they, Thomas Cook, but they were not in Sydney. So in Sydney, you had to find your own hotel, you had to change your own money, you had to set up your own tours, and therefore, I believe, these travel guidebooks that were locally created to basically connect you with the travel operators in Sydney became much more useful. Does that make sense? People would connect to Sydney through this literature rather than having a third party that was Thomas Cook to be able to do that. So the particular tourists that are coming to Sydney, we could say maybe they want to go off the beaten track a little bit more. They want to go to Sydney for their own reasons, but they don't uh, need an agent to do it. And this starts pretty early. You remember the Grand Tour? Yes. <laughs> Good. Because it hasn't forgotten you. Yeah. Someone was destined to go on the Grand Tour. He was the perfect candidate to go on the Grand Tour. His name was Sir Joseph Banks. Came from a very wealthy family. And um, in the late 18th century, that's what he was being groomed to do, to go around Europe. But he comes up with an idea to go a lot further. And he comes up with also a great quote, one of my favorite Banks quotes. He says, every blockhead does that grand tour. My one shall be a trip around the whole globe. He says that in 1770. So Banks wants to go further afield because he doesn't want to be a blockhead who just follows the same circuit, the same tour, the same route. He wants to go explore. And I think that resonates quite a lot a hundred years later with some of the travellers that are coming to Sydney. What I'm going to do is put you in the footsteps of some of those travellers and I'm going to pick, a, well, there's so many of them and there's so many diaries written, there's a lot to choose from. Two of the most interesting are twin sisters called Rosalind and Florence Hill and they are described as lady tourists. And they decide to take a trip to Sydney in 1875. And they are not only visiting Sydney, they're going to spend uh, nearly a year in the colonies. And uh, people back at home are like, oh, crazy, 
You're going now to that convict hell. You know, you're going to get taken by a pirate or a storm along the way. You'll be you know, snuggled into a bush by a swagman when you get there. It'll be horrible. And they have to defend their decision to go down as lady tourists. Say, yeah, I think we've got to figure it out. Don't worry about it. And they're going to write a book in 1875 published called What We Saw in Australia. Great text, written by these two lady tourists. And um, part of it was this idea of getting there. People are saying, yeah, these days, every, every person I talk to about um, the fact I'm from Australia when I travel abroad, I say, oh, have you ever been to Australia? Oh, so far. It's just too far. I can't do that long haul. You know, 24 hours of sitting there drinking free wine and watching movies. I can't do that. You know, that's just too far. And that is what we say today. But it was very much what people said in the 19th century too. Sydney? It takes months. It takes months to get to Sydney. What an uncomfortable, horrible trip. Yeah, it could be good when you get there, but to get there, it's too far. So they were up against this, and they had to defend themselves about how it was just a destination that was too far away. And they had to say to people, it's not as far as you think anymore. In fact, in the guidebooks at the time, it has become a pretty quick route. This is Matic, 1872. We'll get back on stage now. Via the Suez route, a journey from London to Sydney by the P&O Company steamers can be accomplishment, accomplished in about seven weeks, 1872. While the homeward journey by way of San Francisco occupies about 48 or 50 days. Now, that's 1872. In 1840, when the very last convict ship came to Sydney, it had to go around Africa. Convict ship, ironically named the Eden, was the very last one that brought convicts to Sydney. And that took 19 weeks. So the journey's almost three times quicker because of the Suez Canal. So it's not that far. Not only that, once you get to Sydney, have a great time, and then a new line of very speedy mail steamers carrying mail and people and things across the Pacific took you to San Francisco and that occupies uh, only a few weeks and then you get to San Francisco and there you caught the transcontinental American Railway across all of America to New York and then a steamer back towards uh, your destination in England or Europe and that only took 48 or 50 days so it was these massive changes that meant that tourists like the Hill Sisters, could actually get there pretty quickly. And that was a big part. So transport was one of the big deterrents for a lot of people. A rough sailing ship didn't sound too good, but a quick steamer wasn't too bad. So we have quotes in the uh, 1870s that it's not as bad as you think. The, um, the Hill Sisters actually say that they are convinced by experience that to persons of average health and strength, the difficulties of a voyage to Australia and a tour in the colonies exist only in the imagination. Okay, it's 1875. By 1878, the Sydney Morning Herald said this, The trip across the mild latitudes of the Pacific is wonderfully calm and pleasant, resembling a pleasure excursion rather than anything else. The stay at Honolulu gives the tourists an opportunity to make the acquaintance of the dusky descendants of the murderers of Thomas Cook, uh, Captain Cook. <laughs> When I read that, it reminded me of a, uh, a documentary that I got to, to watch uh, in my recent masters called Cannibal Tours. Um, and it was, uh, it was produced in 1988, and it was about basically this idea of, of going into the Pacific and, and seeing these cannibalistic murderers and so on. Uh, and it's funny to see that in 1878, that was still part of the itinerary. Um, and the person who showed that to me is actually sitting in the audience tonight because what I haven't revealed yet is that my supervisor has actually come along to my presentation tonight. So Associate Professor Annie Clark of Sydney University, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that's one of her favourite films, isn't it? And after it finished, she turned to everyone and she said, there's this battle of these horrible English and American tourists who go to Papua New Guinea and want to go on a cannibal tour. And they're so gross and they, they talk about why they're there and, and you sort of think, ah, oh, that's, that's what we are, we're, we're parasites of these cultures. And at the end Annie said, there's a bit of that in all of us, isn't there? <laughs> Everyone can relate a little bit to that. And sadly you could. 
So that was happening. Um, so the, tr the tour across the Pacific was not only comfortable, you could go and, and have a good time in some of these islands along the way. Um, now I want to talk about, uh, oh, the last thing I want to mention is this idea of communication. Communication means that you can plan your trip. Communication, the better it is, um, the more uh, convenient and also the more uh, applicable mass tourism can be because people know when you're coming to book in for the next train or the next steamship or the next hotel. So communication is key and up until the 1860s and 70s, Australia is so disconnected from the world because we have to rely on mail boats. We're relying on these ships to bring a physical letter. What happens in 1872? It's called the Overland Telegraph Cable. Sydney connects to Melbourne, connects to South Australia, connects to Darwin, connects to Asia, connects across the Middle East, connects to Europe and London. You could send a telegram from Sydney and ping, 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 its ultimate destination was London. That's completed in 1872 as well, which meant you could book your hotel from London or uh, vice versa, um, and it would be shot there. So we're looking at big transformations. Leading into all of this is this idea of traveling across uh, the world to get to Sydney, but it wasn't really, uh, you know, it, even if it was a pleasant journey, you were desperate to get there by the end, and then you sailed in through the headlands, and this is what the Hill Sisters say. Cue, change, slide. Okay, this is a P&O steamer. Next slide. Rosalind Hill. Next slide. Okay, you're coming in to Sydney Harbour, that circular key in the 1870s. They say, ever since we landed in Australia, as the Hill Sisters, 1875, ever since we landed in Australia, we had heard about the beauty of Sydney Harbour. Thus, our expectations were highly raised, and they were not disappointed. As soon as we entered the heads, we witnessed innumerable promontories and bays. At her feet, beautiful houses peaked, out from amongst the luxuriance of trees. As we steamed up the harbour, new beauties revealing themselves at every moment, various objects of interest were pointed out to us by fellow passengers. Sydney, and this is a fantastic line, I think we should bring this in today, Sydney has been likened to a hand with the fingers spread out, the intervals between them representing the inlets of the harbour, which penetrate far into the town. The port was busy with shipping, Boats and small steamers were flitting around about in all directions. On landing, we drove through the streets, which looked so familiar, we could have believed ourselves in any seaport, any seaport town, or at home. We went to Petty's Hotel. Petty stands upon a height, and from our balcony, we could look down through the trees upon the shipping and the water sparkling in the sunshine and catch glimpses of the beautiful bays around the harbour. So that is their introduction to Sydney. They're sailing in through the heads. This has been beautifully set up. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for coming. And they get to Petty's Hotel. That was how everybody got to Sydney. You didn't fly into Bondi Bay, you sailed in. And that was a glorious, romantic introduction. Everybody was a cruise ship passenger. We don't have any more. Petty's Hotel. Can we have a look at that? This, how many people on those ships? That's a great question. We're looking at usually uh, two to three hundred. Um, there was a line of steamers created solely for the trip from England to Australia, and they could fit 130 first class, uh, 150 second class, and 300 third class, and that was seen to be the largest, so that was about 500, and they were sort of breaking all the rules by doing that. Um, a little bit later, I'm gonna talk about the Great Eastern, and that comes along, and that can take 4,000 without refueling. But you'll see the size of it, it was the Titanic of its age. In what year? In what year? We'll get there. <laughs> Petty's Hotel was anything but Petty. Penny's Hotel was the first international hotel of Sydney. It had been around since the 1830s and uh, it grew to be basically somewhere that if you had money, if you were 
uh, coming in for a sophisticated tour of the colonies, you had to stay there. It has about 40 bedrooms. It was described as being laid out like a gentleman's mansion with this garden at the front. It, it, it's located at 1 York Street, which is very, it's very close to here, up on Church Hill. And these balconies up the top, which looked over Darling Harbour, and that is the description that the Hill Sisters give of looking at the ships toing and froing in the harbour there. And um, we have a couple of great descriptions of it. One of them is by an oared traveller who arrives here in the, the 1870s. He says, Petty's Hotel was the home of all that is modern in art, marvellous in science, and magnificent in upholstery. <laughs> he had a real life. <laughs> Trouble with Petty's was it came with a ghost because in 1866, a little bit before the Hill Sisters, we had our very first royal visitor to Sydney. He was a French prince. He was the grandson of King Philippe. And he was here, again on a coming of age grand tour, but to Sydney. And he was of ill health. We can cue a slide there. And he didn't look very well. And they sent him across the world to catch the ears of Australia. So it was all about coming down to the Antipodes where, you know, it was supposed to be fresh and, and good for your health out of, out of Europe. So he came along and he loved fishing. So his name was Prince de Con, and uh, he came in to stay at Penny's in 1866, and he was given a royal welcome by Sydney. We took him to balls and recitals, and um, he was the first royal visitor, and everyone's obsessed with monarchies back then. Yes, he wasn't an English royal, but he was a royal, so they really took care of him. They loved him because he was, he was, he was sort of, you know, a, a, a late teenager, I think he was 20 years old at the time in 1866, and uh, you could tell that this is the first time he'd been away from his parents. <laughs> so he had starry eyes and all of these balls with these sort of Sydney girls lining up for him. Trouble was, it was quite cold at the time. In the middle of um, August, he went on a, a fishing mission across to Man Manly, so with a, with a few friends, they went fishing. And um, he came back with a bit of a cold and a respiratory uh, sickness developed. Three days later, no more Prince de Comte. <laughs> Our first royal visitor died in a horrible coughing fit that the whole hotel could hear in his room at Petty's in 1866. And this is prior to the Overland Telegraph, so his family couldn't find out in time to get to the funeral. So Sydney basically had to do it themselves. It's going to take a long while back to ship the body. And, um, the proprietress, who was a female pub owner, a hotel owner at the time, at Petty's, decided to, to go all out. So she bought something like 10 kilometres worth of black drape and she wrapped Petty's <laughs> like, a, like a sort of black funerary box. She, she thought, it had to be really solemn because every consulate and every royal thing in the city had put their flags at half past. He's died in that house, so they sort of turned Petty's into a coffin. And for her efforts, I'm not sure if she knew that at the time, she... I can... Of course she has a name. I can give you that by sending you the, the article that I had published in the Daily Telegraph on about this very story. <laughs> and I'm going to give that to you now. So, just to put you out of your misery. So I brought it along. You can tell us that. Okay. It is, it is very important, and I'm, I was waiting for someone to ask that question, and you... So, your name? We'll make a deal. So the funerary procession uh, was taken care of in Petty's by Mrs. Roach. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I get my primary sources, and it's very hard to get a female first name a lot of the time. Mrs. Roach is all I can do. There's the newspaper article on the event. Mrs. Roach. And she was sent over uh, 500 pounds by the, the French monarchy for doing this later on. That's a hell of a lot of money back then. So um, that paid off. And they had a huge funeral which carried the, uh, the coffin all the way from Petty's Hotel through the streets and everyone came out of their shops and it was all dressed in black. Uh, it's 1866, as I said, to St. Mary's Cathedral and um, because he was a Catholic, it was the biggest Catholic 
uh, sort of royal wet, uh, <laughs> funeral that they'd ever had in um, in Australia. So they, they did all these strange Latin ringing of the bells and stuff, and all the stuff that, that maybe if you grew up Catholic, you went, what are they doing? They did all of that. Um, so that was the, the ghost of Prince de Conge. And people went, boy, that's a bad start to our you know, career as a, a host for royal tourists. Two years later, we actually had a British monarch here. Okay, we had Alfred, who was the son of, of Queen Victoria. He came along and we went, let's take care of Alfred. And uh, we took him around the harbour again, and we took him on all of these um, picnics and excursions. And we had an excursion at Quantaf. And a mad Irishman came into the fold and shot him in the back. <laughs> and, and not only that, this mad Irishman with a gun ran in, shot Alfred in the back. And the description of it is that it was the first time that all of these Australians who sort of felt that they were British could say what everyone had wanted to say ever since they, you know, had read medieval history. Protect the king! And everyone started diving in front of the king, or the king-to-be. And um, sure enough, one of them, bodyguard style, dived in front. The Irishman shot up another bullet and hit him and um, hit the ground. And somehow he survived. Four weeks later, he was knighted. So it paid to look after the royals when they were in Sydney. Sydney felt so embarrassed about this, so embarrassed that it hadn't protected its two royals enough, they've been, been killed by fishing trips and, and shot, that it thought we can't have any more sick royals in the colony, let's get a subscription going for a hospital for them. So everyone donated to this to sort of say we're sorry, and they built a hospital, which is called the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Okay. So this is what's going on with, with, with Petty's. But Petty's uh, is one of a few hotels. And um, I'm ashamed to say I do have the name on hand of uh, the next. Harriet Jane. Okay. Was it in there? Okay. Thanks for that. Well, Harriet. Mr. Curran was the proprietor of Farlert Hotel, okay? P-F-A-H-L-E-R-T, it's a horrible name. And this uh, hotel was also on Churchill, and it was basically uh, a redo of a, a previous hotel there, and Mr. Curran came in and said, look, we can do better than this. So he produced a visitor guide of his own, which I'll talk about, and in that visitor guide, he says in the third person, Mr. Curran, who previously to leaving on a long visit to Europe had the Oxford Hotel in King Street, has been able to carefully note the arrangements and administration of the most successful establishments in Great Britain and of the continent. And in taking the proprietorship, proprietorship of Farlets, has at very great expense completely reorganized the establishment. He says Farlets Hotel has been honored on many occasions in being selected as the resting place of the governors of neighbouring colonies and of English aristocracy paying a visit to Sydney. Altogether, Sydney has cause of congratulations that in Farlet's Hotel, it has the nearest approach to the European model of what should constitute a modern establishment of the kind. So this is where Sydney is saying, well, we can't lag behind, so the hoteliers themselves are going to Europe to see what you needed to improve in your establishment to bring it up to scratch. So we get that at Farlet. And Farlet is really interesting, Mr. Curran, because, as I said, he creates a visitor guide of the hotel. Now, maybe you run an Airbnb, or maybe you've had experience with going and staying somewhere where usually there's a bit of a printout of things to do in the area provided by the host. So he's doing that. And this was a great way because he had a captive audience. So everyone that checks in want to pay a shilling more and get basically a, a guidebook and people say, well, there's plenty of guidebooks in Sydney. He says, yes, but my guidebook's different. You know why? It was called How to Spend a Week in Sydney, and it organised every day into a self-guided walking tour. Wow. On day one, you visited the Domain and the Botanical Gardens, and it ran you through the whole way to, to see and what to see. On day two, the harbour, including Watson's Bay, Chowder Bay, Circular Quay, Darling Harbour. On day three, Sydney City, 
and its attractions and buildings. Steve Four, you went up the Parramatta River by steamer and spent time in Parramatta and maybe to the Hawkesbury. On day four, you went to the eastern suburbs and beaches, including Randwick, uh, Coogee, Bondi, and Botany. And um, it also said to get there to the eastern suburbs, excursionist omnibuses fly regularly to Coogee and Bondi from the stand near Macquarie Place at the corner of Bridge Street. But by taking a cab or hiring a buggy, a very pleasant drive may be at hand. By taking a cab or hiring a buggy, you wouldn't think I'd be talking about 1878, would you? So this idea of renting a car and going and sightseeing in Sydney, of course their cab is a handsome cab, uh, was all was coming about already in the 1870s. Day six, you went to the Blue Mountains by rail. It's just been connected. You went all the way up to stayed in Lura, where I'm from. You visited the Garden Village. You stayed the night, you went back down the next day, and you spent the late afternoon at a picnic on the harbour, usually at somewhere like Watson's Bay, watching the sunset. That's how to spend a week in Sydney. If anyone's ever pulled up that itinerary every single day, congrats to them. We should make a tour out of it today. But Mr. Curran created this new model of the guidebook, and because he had such an active readership by owning the hotel at which he gave the guide to, he had a lot of advertising material over there. But anything you want was in Mr. Curran's uh, guidebook. Grobina Hotel, can we flick across to that one? It was a beautiful establishment, and um, it had 115 rooms. That's big. That's on Grobina Street. Um, the accommodation of visitors has been further, uh, furthered by the erection of three front balconies. The outlook obtained from these points of vantage is unsurpassed, avoiding charming and ever-ranging panoramic views of the city harbour, and access to the roof is gained by means of a patent Otis travelling lift. So it had an elevator in there to get to a rooftop bar. Telegraph and telephone offices are established in the hotel, and visitors can thus communicate with their friends very early to be able to telephone your mate from a hotel in Sydney in the 1870s. And uh, it says, uh, arrange business engagements with em without ever leaving the house. El electric light and gas is introduced into the rooms and every care has been exercised to make the sanitary arrangements as complete as possible. So very good bathrooms, let's try to say. <laughs> so what I'm trying to get at here, guys, is that Hotels in Sydney were further along than you think by the 1870s and they had a lot of technical facilities but they weren't up to scratch for everybody because we've got quite a few globetrotters going around the world now and the American tourists are going to start to arrive in the 1870s. In 1878 we got a group of American tourists and they were seeking hotels in Sydney and they wrote an article which uh, basically was mocking Sydney's very tongue-in-cheek and um, they were mocking Sydney uh, by saying that they were in a place uh, that whatever they wanted, they were looking for someone to help them out with their luggage or whatever, the only person they'd be referred to wasn't the owner or the manager or the bellboy, it was a person referred to as Boots. And Boots was the name you gave to someone who shined your shoes. So that was the only staff member on hand they could find, the shoe shiner. He would sort of be everything. So they said this. A, I'm going to give you an American accent to get you. You really want to be proud of your birth, your country, your blood, your accent, your clothes, your very kind of hair. Come down here and try a colonial hotel. We accorded it the best and the largest hotel in Sydney. The rooms are about seven by 10 feet in dimensions. The beds are on narrow iron frames, similar to those used in charity hospitals. There's no carpet on the floor, only a small strip of carpet lying there before your bed as you get a light, as you get out in the morning to a light. There is no register, no clerk, no porter, no bellboy, nothing but boots and the barmaids. <laughs> so they said it was very easy to get a drink. Anytime you wanted your shoes polished or you wanted a drink, boots and the barmaids would come along. Anything else, you're in trouble. And that was the best hotel in the city, but they don't name it, so I'm not sure. Could it be Mrs. Harriet Jane Roach at Pettis? I'm not sure. We also had lots of places to eat. In the 1870s, we had three high-class French cafe restaurants and an American restaurant. I'm sure they dined there. And that was its name, American Restaurant. Sydney's nightlife was also not as dull as you'd think in the 1870s. In Maddox's guidebook, it said this, there is an old and very true saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. A stranger will not need to be in Sydney long. 
before he, he finds that this maxim has taken deep root in the minds of our citizens. You could go to the theatres in Sydney, there were three of them. The Royal Theatre, built in 1875, could see 2,700 people. Pretty big. And the Illustrated Guide to Sydney, which I'll talk about a little bit more as the, the one that has the most images in it, it claimed that on the streets nearby the Royal Theatre, the number of drinking saloons which abound is astonishing and will give uh, the philosophical visitor reason to inquire how so many can exist after paying rent and unavoidable expenses. So this idea that Sydney was just full of places to drink, you couldn't even figure out how, how they could afford to stay open if there were so many. And another article said, in fact, by the late 1870s, Sydney was said to be crowded with groggeries of all descriptions, from the fashionable bar room to the commonest pub. Groggery refers to grog, which was coming from early convict days. Uh, it was a specific name given to watered down rum. And we use that as basically any adulterated liquor. So cheap alcohol was a, was a, a groggery bar. So there were plenty of them in Sydney as well. Daytime activities, a lot of things to do on the harbour, a lot of boating and yachting, so on. But I'm going to talk about things that, you know, we may not think Sydney has, because uh, we'll be here all day and we talk about what we already know it does. What about the waxworks? It had basically a Madame Tussauds. It had 87 wax figures, including recent murderers. I'm doing a presentation here tomorrow night called Cocktails and Crime Stories. I'm going to be talking about a famous murder by a guy called Bertrand, and he, he, uh, he murdered his lover's husband, Mr. Kinder. And um, they had Mr. and Mrs. Kinder and Bertrand in wax by the 1870s. You could go and have a look at it. But get this, the waxworks, which uh, was right around the corner, it was on Pitt Street, was open 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. That's a lot of people going to the waxworks. We don't have any museum in Sydney that's open that long today. It's in the 1870s. Likewise, the Australian Museum was open seven days a week, and people were very fascinated by the extinct Australian animals that it had in there. So you could go and see megafauna, which they'd already set up, so giant kangaroos and like protodrons, which is the uh, enormous sort of Range Rover side wombat that used to wander around. And not only did we have the waxworks, we also had a Turkish baths on Bly Street. A Turkish baths that was said to be uh, one of the main features of Sydney and it said Sydney has gained this first class and commodious bath before any metropolis in Europe, Constantinople, Constantinople accepted. So we were the first of all the European places outside of Europe, or even in Europe, to have a Turkish bath. So it's interesting things going on that would be attractions by day during the city. But the big one, of course, was the harbour and the picnic spots and resorts around the harbour, including the botanical gardens. So if we're going to click on botanical gardens, botanical gardens in every guidebook was said to be the place to go and watch. Oh, this is, uh, this is after you spend a, a night going out uh, on the groggeries. Uh, and a day at the museum, that's in one of the guidebooks there, um, visiting the, the bone collections. And this is your view, sort of around where Mrs. Macquarie's chair is. Um, pretty much every guidebook would rave on about the harbour, the botanical gardens, the magnificent scenery along the northern shore of the port, the vessels lying at anchor or passing to and fro, and the picturesque beauty of the gardens themselves form a scene unrivaled of unrivaled splendour. So Sydney was very proud of its harbour, and um, for Sydney in the 1870s, it said it was a harbour which, whether for beauty or scenery or as adaptability as a port, is unrivaled by any other haven in the world. And I think we're still obsessed with it now. There was also this idea that the harbour could substitute from things we lacked. So, okay, we didn't have a Colosseum. Maybe what we lack in history, though, we make up for in nature. And the guidebooks were quick to say this, almost defensively, in their preface, to say, eh, don't write off Sydney just yet. Maddox says, true, there are no ivy mantled towers or old ruins with their deeply interesting historical associations, but there is, nonetheless, sufficient to attract attention and afford food for reflection. No scenery around any city in the world could surpass in loveliness that which can be found in a short radius of Sydney. So that was another thing about Sydney defining who it was as an international place. Yeah, we don't have these big 
massive structures and, and old historical streets with their deeply interesting stories. But we do have this relationship between an up and coming city, a civilized cultural city, on this fantastic harbour, said to be the best harbour in the world. It's the balance between those things that seem to be actually the most attractive thing for tourists as they came in. They love that balance, and I think we still do today. The person who wrote the most about that balance was Anthony Trollope, who I mentioned before, and he gives enormous credit to Sydney's tourism campaign by writing that Sydney Harbour is inexpressibly lovely with nothing equal to it. He will publish that in a book after his travels here in 1871-1872, and um, that will bring a lot of tourists to Sydney, and he'll be quoted in every guide on forever more of the 19th century. But he also said that Sydney siders and Australians are, uh, are big on boasting. He called it blowing. So they're always boasting, uh, particularly about their harbour. And the Hill Sisters, to go full circuit back to them, the Hill Sisters bring this up. They said that, um, this is sort of in their writing, day-to-day -day activity. They said, a delightful excursion to Middle Harbour today brings out a good story. The friends who accompanied us constantly apologised for their demands on our powers of admiration and excused themselves when pointing out one view after another by remarking that Sydney had nothing but her harbour worthy of notice, to which we certainly could not agree, and turning the laugh against themselves by relating a story current at the time. Sydney people are supposed, they told us, never to cease lauding their harbour and demanding praise of it from every foreigner in season and out of season. A party of English naval officers, so the story runs, recently being in Sydney, made an excursion along the shore, taking a tent with them, retiring beneath its shelter for a siesta as they were overcome with fatigue, they placed the sign upon the tent outside to those walking past, which said, Yes, we like your harbour very much, but we are asleep now. Please do not disturb us by asking us again. <laughs> so we're obsessed by our harbour. It's a pretty good story, I think. And it's no wonder that when we came up with this idea of let's invite the world to Sydney, we built an enormous palace looking over the harbour in the botanical gardens that you could see the moment you sailed in through the headlands. Phew. Because Sydney's garden palace would be your grand entrance for the 1879 exhibition. So this is where I'm going to try and bring a few things together to finish off with, guys, because the Sydney exhibition is a story of Sydney's very first uh, international tourist attraction. It was the Olympics of its day. It put Sydney on the global map for so many reasons. So much has been written about it. And one thing I found when I started to dig into it is while this had a million essays written, it has had one aspect neglected. You know what that is? Tourism. <laughs> for some reason, everyone's focused on the architecture, the displays, the politics, but the idea of where did all the visitors stay, how did it help the economy of tourism have a, a basically a kickstart by thousands of people arriving, and how did it basically transform the city into an icon destination, be it something that you could say, oh, that's Sydney. These days, all we have to do is put a picture of a Harbour Bridge or an Opera House. Everyone in the world knows where you're talking about. We didn't have those things yet. This is 50 years before the Harbour Bridge was built and nearly 100 years before the Opera House. Suddenly, with this particular icon, Sydney had something in the annals of the world, in the brochures of the world, in the Thomas Cook agencies of the world. You could go, bang, that's Sydney. So Sydney needed an icon, and the Garden Palace made the perfect icon. It basically summed up everything that Sydney wanted. This beautiful harbour with its botanical forest, its vegetation, its Antipodean wonderland, and then civilization with this enormous dome, third largest in the world at the time, sitting there for everyone to see. Let's talk about the tourism aspect of international exhibitions in general. As I said, Thomas Cook really gets involved in them. The last couple before Sydney takes on its international exhibition in 1879 was in Vienna, 1873. Uh, a huge essay on that says that Vienna's tourism industry started when Thomas Cook got on board to create rail journeys and published the Thomas Cook Continental Timetable to coincide with that exhibition and that hundreds of hotels were, were built in Vienna as a consequence and they've been a tourist attraction ever since thanks to the Vienna exhibition. The next one in 1876 was in Philadelphia, 
uh, and that was the first out of Europe exhibition. Uh, Thomas Cook is involved, but it also started off lots of uh, local tour operators and travel agents connected to the railway companies there. And um, everybody knew that they were enormous benefits to tourism because everybody who went to an exhibition needed to stay somewhere. So you've got this huge accommodation part. And also once you've been to the exhibition a couple of times, well, maybe you want to see more of the city. So then you've got all the restaurants you're going to eat at. You've got the other cultural institutions you're going to go see. You've got all the accessories, people buying souvenirs. In every way, it was about commodifying culture and travel. Exhibitions were microcosms of the world in a huge exhibition palace in these cities, but you had to get there to start with. So Sydney is going to be the furthest that any European or American needs to go to get there, and Sydney was excited by the fact that it was going to receive a lot of visitors. And like I said, tourism has been neglected from the story of international exhibitions in Sydney, but that's only in our contemporary age. Back then, if, we, if you dig into the primary sources, they were very, very concerned. One of my favourite worrisome sorts, his name is Mr. C.Y. Gold. And Mr. C.Y. Gold writes a letter in January 1879. This exhibition will open in September 1879. And this is an open letter to the Sydney Morning Herald. He says, Sir, right to the editor. I'm glad to see that though late, the Sydney International Exhibition for 1879 has been pushed vigorously forward and room being rapidly prepared for for the reception of exhibits from all parts of the world. But one, and to me the most important of the preparations for reception seems to be in a fair way of being entirely overlooked. And I believe it is not to be of such, it is to be of such importance to the credit of the city of Sydney in particular, and this noble colony in general, that it ought undoubtedly to be supervised or taken in hand by some manner by the government, the mayor, the corporations, Sydney and its suburbs, to whose earnest consideration I would submit these remarks. I refer to the accommodation and general provisions for those thousands of visitors and tourists from all parts of the world who will be suddenly pouring into the city and its suburbs. And it must be remembered that we have every reason to expect a large number of them to be men of wealth and rank who will have numerous attendants and such men as would to think it a small matter to take up our ordinary hotels and boarding houses, each one to themselves. He was very worried to see what it was. Because he realized something that I think is sometimes taken for granted with any event, but particularly something as big as this, is it doesn't matter how sparkly the garden palace is, it doesn't matter how amazing the exhibitions are inside, if you had a bad light night's sleep because you couldn't get an accommodation room, they didn't have enough eggs to cook your scrambled eggs and breakfast in the morning, you had to wait in line forever to get into the exhibition palace. Of all of those aspects that you expect as a traveller when you go to a destination and to an event, whether it's Disneyland or the Olympics, if you get that wrong, it doesn't matter how great the event is. That's what you remember. See why Gold had it right? And this was all about Sydney realizing, hey, perhaps we're not up to scratch. We're maybe not, we're, we're not an adequate host to be able to take on X amount of people. And that was a big question. How many people is it gonna be? The last exhibition was in Paris, 1878 their third universal exhibition, 16 million visitors. Vienna had 7 million, Philadelphia had 10. But guess what? They all had a helping hand. Who was that? Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook. This was the very first exhibition that Thomas Cook decided, no, I'm not going to be involved. Now that's not to say he didn't think Australia was going to be profitable as an exhibition place, because he gets involved the very next year. That was a real salt in the wound to Sydney, because who's he get involved with? Melbourne, 1880. He resumes organising trips there, but he skips Sydney. So Sydney has this exhibition, it knows a lot of people are going to come, has no idea how many because it doesn't have organised tourism, it doesn't have this ability to get the bookings from the agent to tell the hotel, all these things that we count on today. So it's in the dark, people are expecting hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, how many is it going to be? And Mr. C.Y. Gold comes up and he says, I've roughly computed the minimum number that he thinks should be relied on to come from Europe. He says, let's expect 5,000 English, 2,500 French, 3,000 Germans, 6,000 Americans, 5,000 Europeans and Asiatics, 3,000 New Zealanders, and at least 20,000 from the Australian colonies. Totaling 45,000 people, minimum, 
that are going to need accommodation. Sydney's population, okay, was only, if we look at all of Sydney together, about 80,000 at the time. So that's 50% of the population arriving, and that's just in the city. I'm talking about 80,000s right out to the Blue Mountains and needing accommodation. So this was freaking a lot of people out. But not only that, this was Sydney on the world stage. It wasn't just England watching anymore. We were a British colony, but now suddenly, lots of weird places are going to be paying attention. We want to tap into their travel markets. These are the countries that are coming and accepted our invitation to come. Belgium, Canada, Cape Colony, which is uh, South Africa now. Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka now. Denmark, Fiji, India, Manila, Netherlands, New Caledonia, New Zealand, and Switzerland. So that is uh, those outside of the main ones that we know are coming along to pretty much every exhibition. So they're newbies. So of course, your French and your Germans and your Italians, all of the, all of the staples are there, but we're getting all these other places are coming along as well. So over 20 different uh, nationalities across five continents are going to be coming to Sydney. And by the mid of 1879, they start to launch their ships. So Sydney needed to be ready. So whilst they're knocking up the Garden Palace and starting to make it, uh, okay, uh, starting to make it into uh, you know, a beautiful building, other people are worried about this idea of what we're going to do with the accommodation. And a few others are going, well, our tourism model doesn't require being worried about accommodation. Who are they? Travel book publishers. They don't need to worry about the operations of accommodation. All they have to do is publish lots of copies of travel books. They think they're going to be the ones that really win out of this. Up until the Sydney exhibition, there were three travel books in Sydney. So that would be like, today we have like The Lonely Planet, and then I know there's about a million other brands I can't think of it right now, but you go into a travel bookstore, if there is one, or a normal, if there are any bookstores left at all, and you've got these sort of different brands, okay? So there were sort of three on Sydney, up until 1879. Once 1879 comes along, there's nearly 15 of them. It's a lot of travel books getting involved in this market. We have some big ones coming along. One of them is the one I've talked about, the Illustrated Guide to Sydney. They spent a racket putting this together with 50 illustrations all the way through. We have uh, ones that copy the self-guided walking tour model. We also have a lot of retail ones getting involved. And they're quite interesting because they basically say, we'll give these out for free, and I'm sure they were more of a pamphlet than they were a book, but you had to come and buy something at a clothing store or a druggist. So they were handing out uh, Sydney guidebooks for customers. Then we have a really interesting one, and that was run by a coffee palace. It was basically uh, a coffee palace called Johnson's Temperance Coffee Palace, and they produced this handbook where every page, every first page was about Sydney and every second page was uh, an advertisement for some of their menu and uh, or an illustration of the dessert. So what I'm trying to say is suddenly we had some synergy going on between hotels, guidebooks, retail and hospitality and I believe that's the very first time that those elements started to all join forces to tap into a travel market in Sydney using the Great Exhibition as the factor that people were going to be coming for. And I would like to say at that point, we could probably define tourism as a word in Sydney, because it really was taking all of these different operators, independent operators, and basically bringing them together as an industry which tapped into travel money. That's at least the argument I would like to bring forward. In any case, these guidebooks were riddled in Sydney, and um, people were saying, that uh, business is going to be good, but we do have to get it right. And the Sydney Morning Herald started to pick up on this idea. One guy says the chief aim of everybody will, of course, be to secure the golden harvest that the exhibition visitors will bring in their pockets. But, he says, how are we going to lodge all of our exhibition visitors? This threatens to become one of the social problems of our time. So far, Sydney is entirely unprepared for the great influx of people, he says. Excursion fairs will bring thousands of people, and they're excursion fairs that are non-Thomas Cook related, so they're independent excursion fairs operated by other agency beliefs. Thousands of people by sea and land. We already hear of inducements being offered by steam companies to visitors from England and the continent, and similar privileges will doubtless be afforded to people in America and in the East. Money will be plentiful. 
for no one will come to see the exhibition without being prepared to spend money. But if no accommodation can be had, part of this money will be spent on getting away and the city, uh, getting away from the city as quickly as possible. And the balance, which otherwise would be spent in Sydney, will be taken home again. Got to get the tourism stuff right. So what do they need to solve? Accommodation. And they come up with wild ideas. This is both people writing into the newspaper and a special commission that was part of the uh, exhibition board. They were basically put in charge of, of finding the solution to accommodation. One idea was to rent this ship. This is the Great Eastern. This is the ship I talked about before. Could carry 4,000 passengers without refueling from England to Australia. It had been a migratory ship. They thought that they could repurpose it. And um, this was a great idea in some ways because they said it could be utilised as a huge floating hotel once reaching Port Jackson, thus at the same time becoming a source of profit to the owner and helping the solution of the problem. So not only could get them there, but then you could float this hotel on the harbour, the very first major cruise ship, and people could all stay in it. So that's 4,000 people taken care of right away. Mr. Gold ticking them off. That was an idea and they nearly went there, but they didn't rent that ship. What they did do was buy a couple of Pacific Mail steamers and they do knock up some floating hotels in Sydney for that purpose. And so we do take that idea on board, but not to this extent. The other idea was to transform the colonial uh, exhibition building, which was in Cook Park, uh, sorry, in um, Phillip Park. And that uh, near Central Station was where we had previous exhibitions prior to it being an international exhibition. Convert that into a giant hotel based on the model of the Sailor's Home Hotel, which is in the rocks. So basically, just sort of dormitory beds that would be uh, somewhere people could crash. So just, just getting numbers in. So that was the big thing. Okay, maybe we can fit the high class people in these fancy hotels. What about all the other people? Let's just give them cheap accommodation. So that was an idea to convert huge buildings. And another idea was to build an enormous temporary accommodation that was supposed to fill, uh, fit about 5,000 people inside Cook Park. So that's in, in, in Hyde Park area. So these were all proposed and Sydney was taking this very seriously. But the level-headed guy who was in charge of the board of the commission uh, into the exhibition, he said, hang on a second. We're not the first place to have an exhibition. Let's look at the other cities that have come up with different solutions. And he looked at Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, before they started spending all this money to build all of these hotels, they did something pretty practical. What they did was try to account for every piece of accommodation in the city. That's a big part of tourism, knowing how many spare beds you have. Before you get all carried away and say, we can't do it, well, let's figure it out. So what they did was start a hotel registry board and they encouraged every hotel provider to send in how many beds they had, their fees, some uh, some values of their accommodation, you know, to have these facilities, and a couple of other bits and pieces. This was the very first accommodation comparison site. This was Expedia for Sydney of the 1870s. The board, by the time the exhibition opened, had a, 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 a registry of 26,000 beds. 26,000 beds had been accounted for across the city. Most of them came from small boarding houses and little hotels because every single inner city and even outer city suburb had a pub on every street. And they could fit a dozen, but you times a dozen by this, by this, by that, and you add it to other bigger ones in the city. What they realized was Sydney had so much more accommodation than everybody realized that the tourism industry had moved further forward than people had realised. And that instead of needing to build all this stuff, they could actually use the registry to spread people out a little bit more. So people would write in or telegraph in to say, where can I stay? And they thought, oh, we've run out of beds at Petty's, we'll move you onto there. So they started a centralised accommodation booking system. This is in 1879. And that will be the basis of the very first tourist bureau that will come about in 1884, uh, a few years later. They sold it, but they also didn't need to worry about these huge tens, hundreds of thousands of people coming because not as many people came as they thought. It wasn't enormous. People blamed the fact Thomas Cook wasn't involved, also blamed the depression that had just come off, and it's impossible to get a figure of how many international visitors were there. My guess, it was between five and eight thousand, okay? They were expecting tens, maybe hundreds of thousands. But that's not to say people didn't come. 
They came from the colonies, they came from Australia. The statistics at the end of the exhibition said that they had had uh, 1.17 million visits, but strangely, they don't discern between people who've gone multiple times. So instead of visitors, it's people that have you know, maybe done six visits themselves, so they account for a lot, and they didn't distinguish between colonial and international visitors. I have searched for countless hours to try and get a better figure than that. I can only give you a guesstimation. But what I will say is, you had an incredible time in Sydney, the first of its kind. Warships from 17 different countries were there with their military, exhibition ships from 20 different countries, floating hotels that we'd arranged and others that had come up from other places like Adelaide and Tasmania, plus all of these dignitaries from different countries coming in, princes from Russia and from Japan. Not only that, you had uh, some very interesting characters coming along which were called criminal tourists. And the um, <laughs> newspaper in, in uh, Sydney Morning Herald a month in said, um, for some time past, the detectives of Victoria and New South Wales have been in possession of reliable information from England that a number of swell mobsmen, which is a thief, and expert thieves from England and the European continent uh, purposed uh, uh, paying a professional visit to Sydney during the impending exhibition. So they're coming in, they're buying a fare here because they know that exhibitions are great to be able to pilfer from pockets whilst they're there. So imagine all of the multiculturalism in Sydney at the time, and there were wild parties, endless picnics, which um, the governor was, uh, we've seen that beautiful image of the, uh, the surroundings there. Um, picnics, another fantastic image of the, uh, the view. Oh, <laughs> where's this picnic gone? There it is. Okay, a lot of picnics going on at the time. Um, they were called VIPs. Uh, these are sort of dignitaries that came along and said social life is becoming very lively. The government who are doing uh, what our American cousins would call their level best to make the stay of our distinguished guests very pleasant. Picnics here and picnics there come and go in quick succession. The last being a trip to the Blue Mountains for the grandeur of our scenery and the engineering skill displayed in the zigzag and the free hearted hospitality of the government. See, they have put the celebrities, it uses the word, among our visitors into high good humour with everything pertaining to the colony. So we had a great mix of people, including celebrity visitors. So this was um, fantastic in some ways because guess what? Sydney pulled it off and it didn't have too many glitches because it had accounted for the hotel rooms and so it had enough places for people to stay. And the other thing they thought of was, hey, if people are coming in through the inner suburbs um, and all these boarding houses, they're gonna end up at the terminus, which was Redfern, the train. So they needed to get into the garden palace. So what do we need to get them from A to B? A tram. So they invented a tram system. Trams in Sydney, which lasted for the next uh, 80 decades, eight decades, began with a single gauge line from the Redfern terminus to Hunter Street to get to the exhibition. And that was said to be one of the most exciting things because it was a locomotive and you caught it and it was a double decker that fit 90 people. So trams evolved from that in Sydney, soon to be replaced by buses uh, by the 80, uh, 1960s. So a lot of things came out of taking care of business, taking care of travel arrangements, accommodation arrangements. And um, this was all going well, and they, they basically wanted to leave a great impression. So the, uh, the impression was what people were gonna take home, of course, and people said that they could get this viewing platform. Um, viewing platform is at the top of the tower there, so you could actually get an elevator up to that, and on any of those, there were all of the towers, had a fantastic view. This was the highest view in the city at the time. So people would ride this thing up there to see all of the harbour. And it said, uh, one of the things exhibition, the Sydney Morning Herald again says, the botanical gardens, the grassy waters of the harbour, dotted with men of warships at anchor and steamers traveling to and fro, the majestic headlands and slopes uh, extending from Potts Point to the heads are opened up to everyone. All our English and foreign visitors appear to dwell on these scenes and their unanimous verdict concerning them, so far as we can understand, is, well, these are really more beautiful and grand than anything I have ever seen. So Sydney won in terms of impression. The interesting thing is, the Garden Palace as an icon will only last three years. And then, one day, in September 1882, no one really knows why, a lot of conspiracy theories at the time, the Garden Palace went up in flames. An enormous inferno erupted and it burnt to the ground. 
The conservatorium predates the Garden Palace, but it's very close. So if you go along Macquarie Street, this painting's taken from Macquarie Street, um, the Garden Palace still has gates there with um, the shape of the dome of the Garden Palace. And just behind that, there's a rose garden and it has a fountain and that's the circumference of the dome. That's the only reference we have to it. Your conservatory is down to the left and um, you've basically got Government House a bit further on. And at that time, you also had the fortress of Fort Macquarie. Uh, Fort Macquarie. Um, thanks for coming, Annie. I'm just including it. She's read it, so it doesn't matter. Of course. Wait, Annie, 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 Annie. The reason I bought this paper is for you. So it went up in flames, and uh, this was a huge loss for Sydney, of course. What's quite ironic, guys, is that basically Sydney would forget about the Garden Palace within a generation. A lot of people I talk to now never knew it existed. I wonder if we lost the Opera House, how many generations it would take uh, before people just didn't even know that we had one at all. And it wasn't there for that long. The people who remembered the Garden Palace are basically the ones who visit, see, leave the exhibition, and take with them a guidebook. The Illustrated Guide to Sydney, they're the remains, the ashes. This is the illustrated uh, version you would have in the main guidebook in Sydney and in the catalogues. And they're the ones at home who remembered what Sydney looked like based upon this. So the rest of the world, the international tourists, use this icon of Sydney to reference Sydney long after we actually lost the icon itself, which is, which is really interesting, I think. Question there? Who was the architect? Who was the architect? It was James Barnett. James Barnett was the colonial architect at the time. He got some help, of course, but he knocked it up in seven months. The reason it burnt down so quickly was because it was basically a wooden frame timber um, uh, building, but it was, was coated with stone outside, um, but it just needed to spark from the inside and it went up uh, in the inferno. They've knocked it up in seven months, they've worked around the clock, and they employed um, electric lighting to work 24-7, which is the first time they've done that. In every way, it was an amazing structure, guys, and um, I think Sydney was so sad at losing it, most people were, that they sort of forced it out of their memories, and within a generation, it had gone. Finally, finally, what was the aftermath? Well, all of the things that I said, Tourism had now become centralised. It had basically a place to go to to find accommodation and to book transport. And that would come about two years after the thing burnt down, our very first tourist bureau. The tourist bureau was originally on Market Street. It got so popular, it moved to Bridge Street. And um, the owner of it started something called the Strangers Room, which was somewhere that um, internationals could come in and, and um, basically rendezvous and uh, get all of their guidebooks and all the necessities they needed. But it also followed Thomas Cook's principles, so it organised coupons for tours in the colony, um, connected to rail journeys and accommodation, let's say the Blue Mountains. Um, it was sort of a, a local version of Thomas Cook, but it was in Sydney from the mid-1880s, and it started to do big business, it was doing really well. Um, and a lot of things were written about it. So, for instance, um, travel writers were saying, I wonder how many of my readers, this sort of blogger in 1888, says, no, we have a tourist bureau in Sydney. There's an institution similar to those of Mr. Thomas Cook and Sons in London. Speaking generally, the ob object of the office, office is to undertake all the bother, work, and worry connected with travelling. The manager always meets his clients, advises good accommodation at reasonable rates, guarding the travellers with the extortionate charges on every score. Such an office has been supply, has supplied a want which has long been felt in the colonies and is speedily becoming the recognised rendezvous of strangers to the metropolis. Comfort and economy are guaranteed by putting yourself in the hands of the Tourist Bureau. So this is before we had a government-sponsored Tourist Bureau and office in the 1890s. And not only that, cultural institutions like the Powerhouse Museum, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, really be born off the back of the fact we've lost somewhere to house all of our exhibitions. The trams will continue, and Sydney will start to really reap the benefits of the fact, like the Olympics, 
the world spotlight had been put on it for the exhibition and therefore everybody wanted to come and have a look either the exhibition building was gone because so much attention was given to the beauty of the harbour and the structures it wasn't just the exhibition house itself it was the way that sydney operated that people wanted to come and see so the numbers really go up i guarantee you if you walk around the inner suburbs of sydney particularly places like darlinghurst surrey hills have a look up at the year that most corner hotels were built and most of them you will find are either 1879 or 1880, 1881. So many hotels are built during that period because they realized the crush was gonna come. So the tourism statistics go right up at that point. Now to finish off, of course, we started for two decades, entrepreneurs, local operators, getting Sydney ready to become part of the international travel network. And once we did all the work, Thomas Cook came in, bought the uh, tourist bureau of the guy Cunningham who was in charge there basically turned into a franchise and in 1889 set up the very first Thomas Cook Travel Branch Agency on Bridge Street. So that leads into where most people say international tourism starts with Sydney. So the foundation I've given you is, is all the way up to that. Sir Henry Parks would come out for this one. It was a big deal that suddenly we had uh, Thomas Cook in town and to finish off he says uh, in declaring the office open, that he became acquainted with the proceedings of Thomas Cook and Son in Leicester some 26 years ago. At the time, the firm had been in existence for many years, although its operations were then extremely limited compared to what they were today. Their communication had now spread literally all over the world. It was a, it was a gigantic undertaking and had been so well carried out in the past, he regarded it as a great advantage to, us, to the Australian public that the firm should open a branch in the city of Sydney, and it would certainly facilitate the means of travel, and thus be a conducive, would be conducive to the pleasure of many. The branch manager, in responding to this, said that the objects of the firm in Sydney were twofold. The first was to attract an increased number of visitors from England, India, Canada, America, and Europe, and to this great, uh, to this great continent, and to New Zealand, thus in a measure securing the attention of capitalists towards the magnificent resource of these lands and to enable tourists to enjoy the famous resorts with comfort and convenience. The second object was to facilitate tourists to travel from Australia to Europe, Egypt, Nile, the Nile, the Holy Land, going east or west. Tourists will be able to obtain from the local city manager tickets or travelling coupons at the lowest rates for any of the ports, and they will be met on arrival by officers of the firm who would give them every attention and find accommodation, change circular notes into the currency of the country, and receive forward letters and render a thousand services. He concluded that Thomas Cook's presence in Sydney would afford the greatest convenience to every globetrotter. Thank you very much. It's a fantastic park to have you guys out here and um, a lot of information. Pieces are a bit like that. I tried to squeeze it in, but uh, hopefully uh, you can digest that. And um, if you'd like to find out any more or even get a copy of um, my writing for that particular piece, then feel free to give me your details and I'll send it across. But it's been fantastic to have you. Really appreciate you coming out and I'll see you all again. Cheers.